It's time for Thriller Thursdays, here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Chapter 5 She wasn't what I expected. Don't get me wrong, a woman will blackmail you, but she'll do it direct. I'd had men march into my office over the years and announce that they were being blackmailed by their hobby women. It usually didn't seem like anything premeditated. More often than not, there were promises made, almost always in aid of stripping a lady of her virtue and anything else while they were at it. And when the promises did not come to pass, the lady was angry and wanted to make Mr. Suddenly Happily Married miserable. I never took the cases because there was nothing for me to do. Something like that happens to you, there are two choices. Bite the bullet or pay the lady. She has no proof, but Mrs. Happily Married will look Miss Formerly Enthusiastic Secretary up and down and know damn well what you did. Most of the men who found themselves in this situation were in something of a high dudgeon about it. They reckoned that there should be a third way and were not pleased to learn that this was not a service I provided. If you can ruin a girl yourself, you ought to also be man enough to scare her if that was what you wanted. And if you couldn't or wouldn't, don't come crying to the big bad Jack because I really didn't give a damn. Most of them took my advice and paid up. They found out that I was right. When they paid, that was the end of it. The girl was almost always so disgusted with what she had sunk to that the matter was dropped. She hadn't really wanted the money. She had wanted to tell, but she wanted you to sweat first. To see it coming and be too stubborn to stop it. And when that didn't work, she just wanted to get the hell away from you and get on with her life. It was not a happy ending. But it was an ending. I did not approve of this kind of transaction, make no mistake, but I was far from qualified on the subject of interpersonal morality and chose not to cast the first stone. On only one memorable occasion have I become involved in such a case, and that was because the gentleman caller in question clearly wanted the former object of his attention dead. I turned him down politely, found the girl, damn near forced her to hire me, then killed the two men that her former beau eventually found to do the job. That one nearly cost me my license, and would have, except that Police Lieutenant Sabian, who hated my living guts, hated men who hurt girls even more. But I digress. I do that. The point is that a woman will turn on you all right, but she won't often plan it, and she won't often bleed you white. And when she does, it's personal. Blackmailers are an entirely different breed. They were, in the most general of terms, mouth-breathing, pasty-faced scum. Worms that would turn on anyone and everyone, but didn't have the guts to do it to your face. They were dirt. They were also men. Often the kind of men that make you embarrassed to self-apply the term. All of which is why the blonde in the notary's office took me by surprise. It wasn't easy to tell in the semi-darkness, but she was maybe 25. Old enough to know better and young enough that she could be playing Janet Timm's role in this little dramatic society if she'd cared to. Maybe that was how they worked it. Two girls in business for themselves. My momentary consideration of this possibility, and the two or three lurid scenarios it immediately caused to burble unbidden into the springtime innocence of my imagination, provided me a suitably menacing pause after my introduction. Yes, the blonde said at last. What? I said, annoyed with her already. Did you want something? Because I'm kind of in the middle of something here, she said. This is a novel line, I said. Let me guess. You're just here to clean the windows? Don't be stupid, she snapped. This is a camera, or are you blind? And this is a gun, I said, keeping the forty-five nice and level. And if you were here on any legitimate business, you would have your hands in front of your face saying, please don't shoot me, instead of trying to bluff me out. She thought about this for a second. Yeah, she said with what was clearly meant to be a distracting smile. I guess I would. So the real question is, who are you, and what are you doing across the street from Janet Tim's apartment with a camera? Put the camera in the bag, by the way, very, very slowly. She didn't look happy about it, but she did it. That's one of the questions, flat top, she said, and how she could tell that with my hat on was anybody's guess. The other questions are who are you, and what are you doing parked down the street in a Ford that looks like Hitler died in it? Maybe you're in my office, I said, reaching forward and pulling the camera bag toward me, setting it on the desk that sat opposite the window. If you're a notary, I'm Sister Mary Francis, the girl said with a sneer. I put the desk between us and prepared to rifle through her bag with my free hand. Nice to meet you, sister, I said. Do me a favor and give me a little spin, would you? 
The blonde raised an eyebrow. You're profoundly not my type, she said. I'm crushed, I said. Spin. Why? She didn't even have the common decency to be nervous, just inconvenienced and annoyed. If I can't make sure you aren't carrying, I said, I'll have to knock you out. I don't give a damn, personally, but it'll play hell with that pretty hairdo. She considered me for a moment and decided that I meant it. She gave a slow, grudging spin. She was wearing a grey skirt that went well below the knee and still managed to show a lot of leg, which is no mean feat. She was fit, probably fast, even in those shoes. She was wearing a white blouse, which might not have been the best choice for a nighttime B&E, but we're all young once. Her jacket was over a chair in the corner, and she was nowhere near it, so for the moment I let that go. Blondie was not armed. Happy, she asked as she turned back to face me. Overjoyed, I said. Keep still. I opened the oversized novelty handbag and found a whole lot of nothing other than camera equipment. Nice gear, I said. Thanks, she said. I get that a lot. Or were you talking about the camera? You aren't charming your way out of this one, I said. Gosh, she said, and I was so hoping that we'd have a second date. Are you actually looking for ID? You think I'd be stupid enough to bring ID on a break and enter? Why not, I said. I did. And you were stupid enough to leave a pile of business cards in the bottom of the bag. Her smile faded at this. I had to squint in the dark and still couldn't quite read them, but it was pretty plain they weren't all the same business card or the same business. So you're a newspaper reporter, I said. That's right. She didn't bat an eyelash. And a florist. And you run a secretarial school. And you're a girl detective. That one's adorable, by the way. The blonde now looked positively sour. And you have about 16 different names. So all we've really established is that you like taking dirty pictures. Why, she asked. You see anything dirty going on over there? I would like to open this portion of the narrative by saying that I know I am a stupid fool for looking. In my defense, I was pretty damn sure that I was in control of the situation. In my further defense, the occupant of that apartment across the way had a figure that could easily have launched a thousand ships, and if there was, in fact, something dirty going on, I suppose subconsciously I would not have minded seeing a little bit of it. Shoot me. Which is actually very nearly what happened next. I was vaguely aware of movement in the corner of my eye. It got my attention, but she wasn't moving her feet, and she wasn't within arm's reach of anything that interested me, so I didn't sweat it too much. A second later, I turned back from the sadly still-clad goddess across the way to the bird in the hand, who now had a nice little twenty-two in her hand. I dove to the right as she fired and hit the dirt hard behind the desk. I did this not because I had to, but because my options were restricted to this or splattering Blondie's brains all over the offices of a perfectly good notary public. She fired again, taking a fair-sized divot out of the otherwise tidy office furniture. I couldn't imagine what the hell she was doing. The way was clear, and if the peroxide hadn't rotted her brains away, she'd have been running just in case I was less disinclined towards blowing a lady's head clean off than my track record thus far would have you believe. That was when I realized that I'd still had my hand on her camera bag when I'd made my dive and it had joined me on the floor. Blondie wanted her camera back, and was either prepared to die for it, or hadn't really thought this one through. I hoped it was the latter. The camera was nice, but not that nice. Where in the hell she pulled the pistol from, I couldn't begin to say. That was on me. Full points to her. And yes, in close quarters, a 22 can kill you just as dead as a 45. But she had a clear route to the door and wasn't using it. That was bad math. I could hear her footsteps on the carpet scrambling for position. She knew she wasn't going to intimidate me, not with that little pea shooter like that. She was ready to plug me if she had to, to get away clean. I respected that, but it also cheesed me off. Thing is... And yes, there was no way for Blondie to know this. But if I wanted her dead, she'd be dead. She'd have been dead when I walked in the room. She'd have been dead before she pulled the trigger the first time. She'd have been dead about six times in the three and a half seconds since then. I am a killer. I say this with no perverse pride, but simple embarrassment. I do not use the designation merely because I have killed people. Lots of guys my age have killed lots of other guys my age. It was a national pastime for about 50 countries there for a while but I was a specialist. Uncle Sam taught me to do the job and do it well. Then he pinned a medal on my chest and pushed me off a gangplank, expecting me to be a regular person again. There had been many sleepless nights over things that I had done, then and since. I reckoned there would be more before I finally met a killer better than me, which seemed the only logical end. It gave a guy a different way of looking at life and death than your average man in the street. It didn't make me better, just different. I worked within the law, and I tried to play for the angels as much as I could, but the angels don't always make it easy. I was a killer. 
And if I wanted you gone, you were gone. That was what set me off when a comedy act like Blondie and her magic disappearing pistol came down the mountain at me. She thought she was playing me to a draw, when all that was keeping her alive was the fact I was fighting everything I had been taught and several degrees of basic animal instinct. If she was serious about this, if she didn't wise the hell up and now, I was going to put her in the ground. Without sticking my nose out, I fired the forty-five into the ceiling above her head and a liberal spray of plaster and dust fell all over the place. A gun like that makes a hell of a racket, and that alone stops most folks in their tracks. Usually you hear a frightened little squeak about a tenth of a second after you fire it, and I was suitably impressed to hear no such noise out of Blondie. But I was pleased to hear what I did. Her footsteps, scrambling out of the doorway at speed. I could chase her down, of course, but the only thing that might come out of that is a chance to shoot her in the back, and I wasn't big on that either. So my blackmailer got away. Hadn't really expected to find her tonight, much less get a good look at her, much less take her camera from her and get a lead on who she was. And I did it all without getting in the way of my client's happy hour, which I assumed he was now having since when I turned back to Janet Tim's apartment, the blinds were drawn. He wouldn't make that mistake again. We were going to call this one a decent day's work for the forces of law and order, and if the gunshots didn't bring the cops down on my head before I could get back to the car and get out of Dodge, I thought I might celebrate with a beer or six and try not to think about what a lucky bastard Roger Mayfield was. Good times. Chauncey Haworth, Mark Slade, and Lothar Tuppen. The demented minds behind the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour bring you... Twisted Pulp Magazine. A journey beyond surreality to worlds you never knew or hoped existed. Worlds of the supernatural. Worlds of dark satire. Worlds of nightmarish futures. Twisted Pulp Magazine. If you thought the 21st century was weird enough already... Think again. Twisted Pulp Magazine. A step beyond your grandfather's pulp. Available at digitalvaudeville.com. That's D I G I T A L V A U D E V I L L E.com. You're listening to Friday Follies. Jokes, laughs, and guffaws to tickle your funny bone on the Mutual Audio Network. Join us tomorrow morning on Mutual for Saturday Story Circle. Bring the kids your coloring books and crayons and get the whole family into a great start to the day with audio cartoons. You can always subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of audio drama that fits your fancy. Or discover Saturday Story Circle in your favorite podcast players like Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.